Yes. Good. Okay. So I'm uh, Nathan Mopinko, uh, data scientist at Simple Energy. We'll be talking about property-based testing. Uh, before, I just want to give the real brief plug for uh, Simple Energy. It's an awesome place to work if you want to learn about functional programming. Uh, so people take it very seriously there. Uh, it's a really good work environment, and you can learn a lot. So uh, with that said, you can also ask me for my card later and get the info. Uh, let's talk about property-based testing. So why should you pay attention? For the next 15 or so minutes, uh, if all goes well, you will discover bugs when are otherwise caught. And this is where I think property-based testing uh, really shines. Uh, the fact that you can actually discover bugs that you wouldn't find <coughs> otherwise uh, have much more uh, robust test coverage than you otherwise would. Um, you also have to think less hard, at least if you think it's hard to enumerate all of the cases you might have to uh, cover. Um, and you have to also have to work less hard, but I think in a more interesting way, you can think more creatively about what the functions are actually doing uh, rather than trying to exhaustively cover all of the cases that could possibly happen, which is really easy to forget cases. Uh, so what is property-based testing? Uh, easy is to compare it to unit-based testing, which pretty much everyone's familiar with. Um, the idea of unit-based testing is you have very specific inputs, some x, you run through a function to get some y, and you know exactly what that y should be. Uh, so we have this example for addition, which would be tested very often, but it's a good toy example to see. Uh, you would have a specific two integers you're adding together, and you know exactly what the output's going to be. Uh, but for property-based testing, instead of generating a very specific input and uh, expecting a very specific output, uh, you instead randomly generate an entire range of inputs. Uh, and in this case, those inputs are going to have some property. Uh, in the case of addition, we'd be looking at odds. We know that if we add two odd numbers, uh, we're going to get an even. So rather than you know writing that like 3 plus 7 equals 10, checking the 10 and even, we just do it for any particular odd number and know that it holds. Uh, so the basic idea is unit-based testing is uh, sort of reasoning by example, and property-based testing is sort of like on its way to like reasoning by proof. It's definitely not to like the proof level, but it's like intermediate area uh, that's kind of nice and a lot more accessible if you're not working in like interest or something like that. Uh, so here's some libraries in my examples today are all going to be in uh, Scala because that's what I'm familiar with. Um, but uh, it was inspired by the Quick Check a library in Haskell, and there are other libraries in uh, JavaScript, Ruby, Python, and numerous others. Uh, so definitely check them out. The main idea was to just give a brief overview of what property-based testing is, uh, rather than sort of specifically like talk a lot about how Scala Check works. But with that being said, so we want to go through uh, some examples because I think that's an, a good way to learn. Um, first, we just have a couple uh, semantic uh, case class wrappers so we can keep our odds and our even semantically separate. Uh, the way that uh, Scala Check is going to work and most of these libraries would work is by creating some sort of generator for your random values. Uh, in this case, it's just an implicit val that we could look up anywhere in scope whenever we uh, declare a test down below. Um, and we're just sort of filtering them in the way that you would expect to generate even and odd numbers. Uh, so the first uh, example is just to check if they're always odd. It um, would be kind of surprising if the way in which we define the generator wouldn't work, but you could define tests like that. Um, and you can see how we're getting, we can get either just a single odd number or we can get multiple odd numbers out, um, add them together, and see must be true. Uh, we can do the same thing with uh, even numbers. Um, same, same thing, make sure that an even number is always even, um, or when you add two even numbers together, you can still get an even number. Um, and a slightly more interesting example, although still pretty uh, toy here, is that if we add an odd and even number together, it should still be odd. So just showing that you don't have to use it entirely only the same uh, type with which you're working with. And uh, also you could have multiple matches if you wanted to. So in the case of uh, you don't have to independently check your even numbers added to zero will still equal the same number and your odd numbers. You could check both of them at the same time in the same test if you wanted to. Uh, which sometimes might be semantically nice. Uh, so let's go ahead and run that test and see if it works. Can you make that text a little bigger? I can. Is that any better? Awesome. OK. So we just see we can get all our output from our test here. So we're in SPT, Scala Build Tools or simple build tools, I remember, um, doesn't really matter. Uh, and so we can see all of our output here when our tests pass, which makes us all feel good. Um, soon we'll see an example where they don't all pass, and we can see the output we'll get when it doesn't pass. So let's look at a slightly less trivial example. 
before we do that, just some ge general o overview of uh, some of the ways that this might actually uh, help in your day-to-day -day, uh, coding, um, at least how does this help me. Uh, one thing is working with collections such as lists. Um, I often find it is really easy to think about the way in which I intend to use it, and usually I don't intend to be working with empty lists. Um, I usually expect there to be data, and one of the nice things about there being randomly generated values is you'll get empty collections uh, generated for you, and that'll be a frequent case where it'll fail, and then you have to decide how do I want to handle that. Do I want to uh, you know, submit some sort of error type, or do I want to just you know, ignore it? Whatever you want to do, it just forces you to deal with that because whatever properties you write won't pass for some things unless you appropriately handle them. Uh, same thing for working with numbers. Um, it'll you know, generate negatives if you wanted to, zero, large numbers. Uh, you can specify you know, that it has particular ones you want to emphasize more often than others. So if you know, working with one is a really important value for you, you can have to generate that more often. Um, the thing that came up at work the other day, uh, some values you might not expect, is that doubles can also be not a number or infinite, and you just don't always expect that. So it's really nice to get this case where you're like, oh, not a number, it doesn't work. Um, and so just Cases like that, sort of expanding the range of inputs that you probably don't sort of on a unit based testing expect to test for. Uh, same thing for crossing over boundaries for uh, dates and times. Um, a lot of uh, you know APIs will handle you know leap years and uh, daylight savings time and all that, but if you have to do internal logic on your side outside of that, um, it can get really messy. And it's nice to have those boundaries checked for you. And also for serialization, uh, checking round trips, you know, just do two serialized from. Uh, and then from serialized and whatever that is, you can just check all of the values, or at least many of the values, really quickly, um, rather than testing just one at a time. Uh, some common pitfalls that can happen is that you just end up re-implementing the function. Um, so if you find yourself in this case of, of, of trying to re-implement a function, uh, just know that most people who've come across property-based testing have done exactly the same thing, so you shouldn't feel bad. Um, but the nice thing about it is that if you are doing that, it, force you to think more carefully about what the function is doing. Um, so you can actually define some property that is independent of exactly how it's been implemented. Um, and we'll see some, uh, hopefully my last example, sort of get at that idea. Um, but also, just because it is a useful tool doesn't mean you should use it for everything. Um, so if it's really hard, if you have a really giant model with a big chunk of code, um, you have this really complicated generator, it might not be worth the time to do that. Um, it's obviously worth of breaking the code down into smaller chunks, but we know that's not always possible. Uh, so here's an example of uh, getting a streaming mean, and a streaming mean would just be where rather than looking at the entire collection at once, we'd be want to look at just one value at a time, so that if our data are stopped or for instance sort of a queuing context, uh, that we could continue to have uh, the mean available to us at any time. Um, so here is just a simple way to implement that, um, and let's see how the test would work for that. So a streaming mean should produce the same mean as a non-streaming mean where we would just sum up and divide by the count. Uh, but we notice here that uh, we get a clear counterexample. So this is really nice, is that whenever we generate uh, our examples, we'll get it, the specific example which it failed. Um, and the default for a uh, scholar check anyway is to generate uh, 100 examples at a time. You can change that for whatever your purposes might be. Uh, but now we can go back in and see that, oh, we got an empty list. Our function didn't support that. So we can now uh, iterate on our function and sort of have property test driven development and reveal, see the problem that was revealed here by this test. And here would be a possible solution. We could add some insufficient data case class that was going to be represent an error, and then we could return a disjunction of either the stats error that we got. It was empty because it doesn't really make sense to have a, a mean of nothing. It doesn't really mean anything. Um, so that would be one possible solution way to handle that. It might not have been revealed to us otherwise. And then a uh, final example just to talk through in terms of a, another way in which, at least for me, it helped uh, expand the domain of things that I was thinking about. Um, and so one example here would be interval clamping. So the graphical representation here is supposed to be the top is uh, some interval of time, and then the second line is some clamping boundary that you want to clamp your interval to. Um, so the desired behavior here that we see in the first case is that the beginning of the uh, original interval starts before the clamping interval, but then it ends sometime in the middle of that interval, and so we just want to clamp it to uh, 
uh, the beginning and create the interval that's represented by the x's. So it would be where the boundary interval started, but then end where the original interval started. Relatively common uh, thing to do in a lot of time and that sort of thing. Um, and so I wanted to write a property-based test that captured uh, this idea rather than sort of re-implementing exactly of like trying to see how long the interval should be. Um, and I thought of you know this first case. I thought of the case where uh, the uh, interval is entirely within the clamping bound, so that's case number two. Um, and then also case number three and case number four, where uh, the uh, clamping interval is entirely constrained with inside the original interval, and then where it overlaps on the other side. Um, and I wrote a test and I thought it should work, and it totally failed. Um, and that was because, uh, as some of you may have figured out right now, there are more cases, um, which are, of course, uh, when they're completely disjoint. And really just a case when I hadn't thought of, oh, this is clearly another way in which this might be used. Um, but that, re that revealed that. And so um, just another good example for me of when it uh, helped illustrate uh, something I hadn't thought of. So uh, just a brief summary. You can generate hundreds of cases, and eventually over time, thousands or hundreds of thousands of cases. And that really helps effectively uh, reveal edge cases. Um, I, just noticed this trend on Twitter where someone mentions that some production bug that has been discovered that they've been running over and over again. Um, and that, I feel like that's like good evidence that it's finding bugs in the wild for people. Um, it's also useful for a sharpening understanding of exactly what a function should be doing. Um, and it's just a more fun way to try to think about how uh, actually everything is behaving rather than just trying to see like these are all the possible cases. Um, my other anecdotal based uh, version is, to, in terms of taking less time to write and also finding bugs, is uh, one of my first weeks at Simple Energy, I wrote what I thought was a really exhaustive set of unit based tests. I wrote like 40 unit based tests that I thought was going to cover like everything that I could think of. Um, and then I got some help writing property based tests, and my second property based test that I wrote revealed a bug that the 40 unit based test did. So uh, your mileage may vary, but it was very helpful for me. So um, thanks. Any questions? Um, I know you mentioned maybe half a dozen different frameworks and different languages, so I wouldn't necessarily expect you to have the answer for this. But do you know if some of them work in such a way that once it's a, once the, the property-based test has identified an error, you want to have a kind of standard assertion test at that point because you know that you've got a bug. So does the framework, do some of the frameworks generate a standard assertion for you, or then you just write it up yourself? Well, I, I guess I, I, the way I would handle it is if I found a case that failed on, I would want to like I would sort of in development record that case as a static version. So you should use like a non-randomly generate, just use that as input, and then fix it so that I never got that case again. So once that passed, then I would probably remove it, but I guess you could keep it around if you wanted to. I don't know specifically about automatic regenerating. Um, but I mean the, the idea is that you generate you know a hundred cases every time you run tests. So you know if you have like you know even a very large team at all every time the build runs, you're gonna be running it like thousands of times. So if it's gonna fail like it's probably going to fail pretty quickly if it's a, if it's a frequent case, you know. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, what would you say is sort of the, the ratio between your Monte Carlo tests and your more analytic tests? By analytic, you mean like specific, like unit tests, like we're having very specific. Yeah. So so finding the critical points in your in your algorithm uh, that will break it instead of like. Um, you mean specifically about simple energy, or? Yeah, like in, in your experience, you are writing these unit tests that are very focused on one particular error. And you're also running these range tests on random distributions. What would you say is your mix between the two of them? Uh, maybe 80, 20 property-based tests. Um, basically, more property-based tests, the better, uh, is sort of where our sort of design philosophy comes from. Um, there don't really seem like there are any significant downsides. Um, you might get like intermittent build failures if you have like weird uh, things you might not expect. But on the other hand, like if you get an inter intermittent build failure, there's some bug somewhere in the code that you would probably rather be at least seeing some of this kind of than none of the time because it gives you that a chance to catch it. Can I ask a question about uh, specs? Because you use specs too. Sure. And you use the, the scope of uh, check in one of your first slides. Is that something that's provided by specs? Or is that something that, is that a scope that, that you 
Yeah. That, that, that one's good. Uh, like this one? Right there. So, yeah, so you uh, get. Next, next slide. Okay. So, you said in check right there? Oh, uh huh. Is that something that's provided by specs? So, that that's part of Scala check. Okay, gotcha. So, sorry, for specs. Yeah. Top, top, and no better. Well, I mean. Okay. Sure, sure. And then all you have to do is return a, your case as a, a function, just something as a function. So inside that, you just specify each case is going to be it's going to take a, one of your Scala check types to a result, and that's all you have to do. Yeah. So as long as you can find an implicit for that and it has a function in it, it, it needs to look for what's called a matcher. Um, okay. Yeah. And then there there are other ones other than must be true. Like there are other ones like you know must be close to, and there's a there's a whole lot of ones you can use. No more questions? Awesome.